We're gathered here tonight to honor the memory of William George Ballard, who was born on the 6th of June, 1930 in Toronto, Ontario, and was promoted to glory on the 23rd of July down in San Marcos. His immediate family includes his wife, Jo, of San Marcos, William David, a son of La Mirada, and daughters, uh, Janet Brandon of Corona and Julie Moyer of San Marcos. Bill had seven grandchildren, seven great-grandchildren, and a sister, Verna Gruendyke of Whittier. My name's Randy Gruendyke. I'm Bill's nephew, and on behalf of the Ballard family, I want to welcome you tonight and thank you for coming. Uh, you'll notice in your order of service that there's a blue card. I want you to take that out and hold on to it because what we'd like you to do is write one word on your card that uh, describes Bill when, when you think of him. Uh, his character, his persona, uh, some aspect of your relationship. One word on this card and then a little later they will be picked up and all those tributes will be shared. So thank you for, for doing that. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the life with which you blessed Bill Ballard and all the ways in which he blessed us. We acknowledge that tonight as we honor Bill, we are really honoring you. And so we pray that you would comfort us during this time, especially Joe, Bill Jr., Janet, and Julie. May we all end up better men and women for having been here this evening, steeled and strengthened for your sake by Bill's example. We pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Listen to this word from the Lord. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. For it is by his power that we have been born anew to a living hope. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and to an inheritance which is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. Kept in heaven for you. From 1 John, and this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. The one who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. This evening we gather to remember, to remember life, specifically the gift of life that we have been given in this incredible man, Bill Ballard, who touched so many lives with his grace, with his humor, with his straightforwardness, with his convictions, and with his quiet confidence. But primarily we gather, not simply to remember the gift of life, but to remember the one who, who gave us Bill Ballard and the one who gives life even beyond this life of earthly life. So we gather to marvel at this mysterious personal God who not only raises Jesus from the dead but by whose power we can be born anew and through whose revealed word we can be sure that we too will be raised to that same eternal life. So all through the service, we'll be reading from God's word, and we'll be hearing from God's people, and, and we'll be singing God's praises, and we'll be remembering Bill Ballard, this, this man of God. It's always hard to know where to begin or how to even begin to capture a person in a service like this. Bill lived this full life across, across many different arenas of life, but tonight we're going to be remembering Bill in just three areas that he touched of his rich life, and these three are, are what we might call some of those anchor points of his life. His family, his involvement with Biola University, and his relationship with this church, La Havre Hills Presbyterian Church. Um, and just, just one comment as we begin. Um, it's a little bit stuffy in here, um, and sort of in a, uh, I don't know if this is a twist of God's humor or something, but um, in good Presbyterian Scotch fashion, we, we watch our, um, our finances around here. So we're on the summer discount plan for Edison, which means they cycle things off every once in a while. We, we rarely have Friday night services, but tonight at 6 o'clock they cycled off the air conditioning. So, so feel free to loosen your tie or take off your coat or whatever, but um, it's probably... It'll probably cool down when we get out of here, because that's probably when it'll come back on. So um, I'm sorry. Um, I'm sure Bill is enjoying this, this gift of um, frugality. But we saved some money, Bill. We saved some money here. So anyway, we hope you'll bear with us. But Bill's nephew, Pastor Randy Grundyke, who's, who's really been so instrumental in pulling this whole service together, will begin that first segment of remembering Bill's family. Don't forget that blue card. William George Ballard was welcomed into the world on a beautiful 75-degree day in the late spring of 1930. His father, William Thomas Ballard, was born on the west coast of Canada in British Columbia. His mother, the former Vera Ellen Pennock, was born on the east coast of Canada in Nova Scotia. Bill, the Ballard's first child and only son, was born in the demographic center of the country, Toronto, Ontario. Here he was brought home to 102 Weneva Avenue, just two and a half blocks from Balmy Beach, uh, located on the north shore of Lake Ontario. Four years later, Bill's only sibling, a sister and my mother, Verna Margaret, uh, was born thereby rounding out the ranks of the Ballard family. Bill's dad was a welder by trade and a businessman by profession. 
As he transitioned from the former to the latter, he moved the family 2,600 miles west to Southern California, where they settled in Beverly Hills. First at 469 South Weatherly Drive, between Pico and Olympic Boulevards, and then at 136 North Ladue Road, between Wilshire Boulevard and Burton Way. These were happy and active years for Bill, who involved himself in everything from music to scouting to sports. In fact, every time you watch the movie, It's a Wonderful Life, and come to the scene in which the dance floor opens up to reveal the pool underneath it, you're looking at Bill's high school basketball court, the one on which he was playing during the time the movie was made in 1946. Growing up in Beverly Hills was filled with moments like that, all of which were passed on in a rather nonchalant, matter-of-fact sort of way by Uncle Bill and my mother. Once I recall expressing my amazement to Uncle Bill that the well-known conductor and composer Andre Previn had attended Beverly High. He chuckled and replied, yeah, I used to wait at the bus stop with Andre Previn. Bill went from Horace Mann School, which to this day unusually remains K through 8, to Beverly Hills High School from which he graduated in 1948. Bill then attended the University of Redlands where he majored in business and was active in the Pi Chi fraternity and played varsity basketball. It was also at Redlands that he met Joe Perhab, whom he married on a crisp January day in 1955 before Dr. James Stewart at Beverly Vista Community Presbyterian Church. Later that year, Bill entered the Army and was soon thereafter shipped off to serve in the Korean War. Because he had been a business major in college, Bill was put in charge of camp supplies, including the athletic equipment. Bats, balls, mitts, and more were kept in a stove-heated Quonset hut where Corporal Ballard decided to take up residence a toasty midwinter alternative to the sub-freezing canvas tents in which his fellow soldiers were forced to bivouac. During his months in Korea, Bill, of course, wrote Joe, but he also wrote my mother many sweet letters filled with brotherly advice and silliness, sometimes identifying himself to her simply by his serial number, 561-94445. Upon returning from Korea, Bill went to work for his father's company. In 1957, W.T. Ballard Incorporated, a material handling business founded at the outset of World War II, was located at 734 East 3rd Street in what is now the gentrified L.A. Arts District. Over the years, Bill worked his way from the service department to the front office so that a week before his 36th birthday, he was named president of the company. Also during these years, Bill and Joe began growing their family, first with a son, William David, who was born in 1957, and then twin daughters, Janet and Julie, who were born in 1958. It was also during this time that Bill and Joe moved from an apartment just above Beverly Boulevard in uptown Whittier to their first house at 741 Dexford Drive here in La Habra, exactly one mile, and I mean 1.0 miles, from this church building. In fact, on March 2, 1958, Joe and Bill attended the inaugural worship service of La Habra Hills Presbyterian Church, where they were received into charter membership 12 weeks later. In the late 60s, Bill and Joe built the house in which they would spend almost the next half century at 15721 Candelaria Court in Whittier, a place that served as a venue for their hearts of hospitality. To many, the Ballard's Friendly Hills home was a place of retreat and rest, significant gatherings and happy times. I may not remember this with crystal clarity, but I do seem to recall one day walking into the Ballard's backyard to find then senior pastor John Wilson presiding over a La Habra Hills session retreat from the shallow end of the pool. Over the coming years, Bill worked hard to expand the family business, relocating its offices to Santa Fe Springs, first in 1972 into a new structure on Clark Street, located just south of Norwalk and Telegraph, and then in 1985 into another new structure just 
north of Norwalk and Telegraph on Mattern Place at the historic Mattern family property. It was also during these years that Bill opened eight regional offices, including ones in San Diego, Ontario, Las Vegas, Nevada, and Portland, Oregon. In 1995, Bill was named president of Mahita, a nationwide association of material handling distributors. Liz Richards, who in 1995 was in her first year as CEO of Mahita, said of Bill, I could not have hand-selected a better person to help guide me through that first year. Bill was the consummate gentle man and one of the greatest leaders I had the pleasure of knowing and working alongside. For me, Bill was a beacon in the dark, a deeply devout man who was the kind of calming force you don't often encounter. Although Bill was kind, of soft, kind and soft-spoken, he had strong convictions and provided sage business advice. If W.T. Ballard was Bill's occupation, then his service at this church, where he was ordained to the diaconate and as a ruling elder, as well as at Biola University, where he was a board member for almost 30 years, were his preoccupations. More about those two areas from others in a moment. For now, when I think of my Uncle Bill, here are just some of the images that come to mind. The global traveler, winging his way with Joe to some far-flung and fun destination. The homeowner, wearing just a pair of shorts and weeding his lawn on a sun-baked Saturday afternoon while listening to Vin Scully call the day's Dodgers game over his transistor radio. The cheerful hiker, clearing a high-altitude pass in the Western Sierra or sitting around a story-filled evening campfire. The consummate pack rat, keeping everything, and I mean everything, as did my mother, but they came by it honestly since most of what they kept was stuff saved by their parents before them. The scary driver, going from gas to brake to gas to brake to gas to brake, Mahita CEO Liz Richards wrote, for as gentle and calm as Bill was, he terrified me behind the wheel of a car. On one occasion, Joe, Bill, and I traveled from LA to San Diego, and he was crazy. Finally, Joe turned around from the front passenger seat and said to me, don't worry, Liz, Bill always drives like this. Another image that comes to my mind is that of the cut-up whether he was dropping a dry one-liner, setting up a punchline, or just being silly. Uncle Bill's delivery was flawless, his timing impeccable, and he always made me laugh. One of his gifts was saying all the wrong things in the most endearing way. In fact, the more he said and the worse it got, the better it made you feel. For example, here's what he wrote to my parents over 50 years ago on the occasion of their 10th wedding anniversary. To our beloved sister and brother, at times like this, it is well to pause and reflect on the aftermath of the terrible event that took place on 831.57. But on second thought, why belabor the grueling concatenation of events? At least you have a fine home, two fine boys, and a secure, happy future. Little enough in these times. Hope things get better soon. The William G. Ballards. <laughs> when I was elected student body president in high school, Uncle Bill sent me a Western Union telegram that read as follows. Congratulations upon being select elected student body president. May you use your power for good, mainly your own. Another, that Im another image that comes to mind is the exemplary boss. I worked at Ballard for a summer, and so I, I saw some of this from the front row. Uncle Bill was known for getting out of his office and mingling with the employees throughout the many departments and warehouses at Ballard, uh, hosting uh, an annual company Christmas party at which generous gifts were liberally distributed establishing a matching gift program to boost the donation of employees that were given to their favorite charities. 
Uncle Bill's benevolence was shaped in large part by his view of business. I once asked him what enjoyment he got out of selling narrow aisle electric forklifts and pallet jacks and warehouse rack. His reply went something like this. I don't see it like that. I see myself as putting food on the table for 120 families. For Uncle Bill, business was first and foremost about people. And then there's the image of the earnest evangelist going out of his way to tell others about the good news of Jesus Christ, the salvation from sin that comes by way of the cross, and the power for living that comes by way of the empty tomb. He did this in all kinds of settings, among fellow travelers in other parts of the world, as well as among those who cared for him while reciting for a time at Whittier Hills Health Care Center just down the boulevard. And finally, there's the image of the loving uncle, encouraging and supporting my terminally ill brother in a variety of ways, but especially with a reassuring, poignant, handwritten letter that greatly buoyed him up near the end of his life and befriending me. From the time I left for college, Uncle Bill visited me everywhere I lived, including suburban Chicago and rural Indiana. Over the years, we enjoyed hearty laughs over lunch, deep conversations on the trail, and phone calls during which he enjoyed hearing about the latest Major League Stadium to which my oldest daughter, Margaret, and I had been in. In fact, I placed one of those calls, one of those excited calls between the two of us right outside the gates of Yankee Stadium. My wife and I gave our youngest daughter the middle name Ballard in honor of my uncle as well as my mother. I loved my uncle. In fact, that's the last thing I told him. How grateful we are as a family that because of Christ, we will someday be able to tell him that again, even face to face. Amen. do encourage you to fill out those cards because we'll be collecting them in just a bit. But if family was central to Bill's life, so was his involvement with, with Biola University. And, and so today we have two important figures from Biola to share with us some of their remembrances of Bill. First will be Dr. Perry Corey, current president of Biola, and then he'll be followed by John Siefker, a member and past chair of Biola's board of trustees. Dr. Corey. Well, it truly is an honor tonight uh, to remember a friend, a friend of Biola, a friend of Paula and mine, and to reflect on the institution that I represent, um, one of the many places, Joe, where your husband, Bill, invested uh, his time, his treasure, and his talents. And on behalf of the nine members tonight here, the Board of Trustees that are Honoring Bill, I just wanted to say um, what a difference he made. So to you, Joe, to Julie, to Janet, to uh, Bill, to the grandchildren, great-grandchildren, um, what a remarkable man Bill Ballard has been for us. I remember the day, the day I first met him. It was March the 26th, 2007. I had flown in from Boston where I was being interviewed for the presidency of Biola, and um, I didn't know anybody out here and got into the top floor of this hotel room in Newport Beach where we met in a conference room, and I walked in there, and there was Bill and others, but I remember Bill. I remember he was so like friendly and amicable and cheery and encouraging and a smile on his face, and I thought, there are people like this in California? <laughs> really? Um, and there are people like this in California, but I think they're all trying to be like Bill because um, he had this effervescence to him that was truly contagious. As we just heard from Randall in those very um, touching words, thank you for what you shared from your heart. Um, Bill did serve 
as a member of the Board of Trustees at Biola University for nearly 30 years. And for eight of those years, he served not just as a member of the board, but as a, the chair of the board under the presidency of my predecessor, Clyde Cook, whose wife Annabelle is here with us this evening. Bill brought so much uh, to the board. He brought a business sense that was greatly needed. He brought a, a passion for the convictions of Viola to be Christ-centered and firmly rooted on the word of God. He brought this desire that uh, we would raise up and educated leaders in the business field that cared more about the people that worked for them than the bottom line. That was Bill. He served on the advisory board for what is now our Kroll School of Business, advocating for many years to advance and expand and develop the programs that we have so that Christians going into the marketplace would have those attributes that he thought were essential as leaders in business and in industry, the characteristics of caring for others, the characteristics of being focused and committed to a mission, the characteristics of integrity and an ethical framework and a moral fiber and this Christ-like testimony. And his vision was realized not in small part in championing that effort when in 1993, uh, through his efforts and support, the Kroll School of Business or the School of Business began and, and has supported our efforts and, and we still remember him to this day, not just from what he has done, but every time we walk past the conference room in the Kroll School of Business that bears his name, we remember that the motto of the Kroll School of Business at Biola University describes Bill's own convictions, and that is business as ministry. Former President Clyde Cook relied on Bill's stable leadership at the helm of the board during some very crucial years when Biola was growing and, and expanding. And Dr. Cook was quoted just with, with these words talking about Bill's legacy. He said, his legacy at Biola is one of the unique characteristic traits in that Bill demonstrates in his humility while modeling professional competence and leading his company that he is a man of God and he did this as chairman of Biola University's Board of Trustees. He went on to say that apart from Bill's energetic and focused efforts, our business program would not be where it is today. We just finished two days of meetings of the Board of Trustees. These are two good days of moving forward, and we're moving forward because we are climbing on the shoulders of former trustees, none quite as unique and gifted and special as our own Bill Ballard. So, Joe, you need to know that this university loves you and Bill, and he has made an indelible mark on our university and our students. And the ripple effect of his life is literally changing lives today around the world. He is and was a remarkable man, and I wrote the word encourager on my card. My words about Bill will be a bit more personal, and I'm so glad that uh, Dr. Corey kind of put a frame around Bill's commitment to Biola, which was high. Um, the first time I met Bill, I think, I'm getting old, so I'm not so sure anymore, uh, was during the process when the Biola board they went through to determine whether I might be a good fit for service as a Biola trustee, so I was being interviewed. Bill was board chair at the time, and he was likely the first trustee I met. First thing I noted about Bill is that he was really tall. <laughs> and he had the biggest smile. It was just so endearing. 
Well, I must have passed the test because I was uh, elected to the board. And during my early years on the board, when Bill was chair, I paid close attention to his style of leadership, both inside and outside the board meeting. Always pleasant, collegial, soft-spoken. He led board meeting discussions with clarity and grace, always allowing the Biola board members to share their opinions, but always managing to bring the discussion to a conclusion. He made the job look easy. As another former chair noted, making the job look easy is the mark of an excellent leader. Bill showed me how a Biola board meeting should be led, and during my term as chair, I did my best to follow his example. During my term as chair, we had a number of important to-dos. We had a presidential transition to manage, which resulted in the election of Dr. Corey. We had a big job of updating our governance bylaws and articles that hadn't been touched for a good long time. And we had a few internal issues uh, that occasionally made the chair job more than a bit challenging. It was during those times that Bill was the first to encourage me and to support me both publicly and privately through those tougher parts of the job. I have a letter Bill sent me back in 2003 with some of Bill's candid and supportive advice during a particularly rough patch. It was warm, wise, and winsome, just like Bill, right? His public support and comments in the board meetings were priceless to me, and more importantly, he always set the right tone for what the board needed to do. Bill loved Biola. Lynn and I also had the opportunity a few times to enjoy dinner time together with Joe and Bill, and, and uh, they were both available to advise us uh, during the times we were chairing. Um, later, when Bill retired and was deservedly honored with trustee emeritus status, he continued to visit the Biola board meetings from time to time. His presence was always positive and encouraging. What would you expect? I missed him. I still miss him. In a nutshell, Bill was a good and godly Biola trustee. He's going to be missed by all of us who served with him at Biola. I learned so much about leadership, Christian leadership, from both his example and his actions. He was my friend and my colleague, and I'm man enough to say I loved him. Joe and the family here, on behalf of the Biola Board of Trustees, we're going to miss him too. But we're going to see him again. Thank you. Thank you, John and Barry. I wanted to, at this time, invite you to take out those cards that you've um, written a word on and pass them down the aisle, and there'll be a few ushers that'll come down and just gather them up so that we can share those in a few minutes later in the service. Um, any of us here today who knew Bill at all knew that, as has been mentioned, that Jesus Christ was at the very center of his life. And so uh, a memorial service for Bill would not be true to him without a time of remembering God's promises and, and singing his praise. And so one of Bill's grandsons, Kellen Moyer, will be leading us now in, in a time of worship in song. Kellen. Thank you. 
by flaming tongues above, raise the mountain fixed upon it, out of thy
my soul. Father, we just thank you for who you are and what you've done for us. You've taken our sin away. You freed us chains and the bondage, Lord, that we have the hope of being with you for eternity, that we can see Bill again, that we can worship you face to face alongside our beloved friend, grandpa, dad, friend, Bill Ballard, Lord, and even now as we're worshiping you, know that he's face to face before you, before your throne, worshiping you. So we worship you and we thank you. Be glorified as we sing. As Randy mentioned, Bill Ballard was a part of this church since the very beginning, worshiping 
at first Sunday, joining the church a number of weeks later, serving numerous terms as elder and also as a deacon. Um, in fact, Bill in 1982 was named the chairman of what was called the Share the Vision campaign, which raised funds to build the new sanctuary, which is where we're sitting right now. He was the one who was in charge of raising those funds, and they broke ground, and the sanctuary was dedicated on May 20th, 1984. Um, Bill served not only on, on Dr. Corey's search committee, but he served on two pastor search committees here, bringing John Wilson to this church in 1975, and the second one, he brought me to this church in 2001. Um, he also served on a search team in 2006, which brought the director of family ministries, Jerry Haraguchi, to, to this place. So he had a heartbeat of this church. Um, and I can say that as um, I was being interviewed to come here, um, Bill was the one that he and Val Bentley had the most time spent with me talking to me before I arrived. And based on that, um, it was a no-brainer to come here because Bill exhibited the kind of qualities and the kind of deep conviction um, that I felt if, if he was symbolized this church, um, this was a place to come. If all these were not enough, probably Bill's greatest legacy at LHHBC was the home Bible study program, which he was a part of launching in 1977. He was one of the four initial Bible study leaders who, who led four initial groups. Pastor John Wilson wrote those initial studies, but Bill eventually went on to, to not only lead a study, but for over 20 years to write the studies, which enabled literally hundreds and hundreds of people over the years to dig deeply into the Word of God. At its height, there were over 200 members here in the church involved in the studies, and these groups continue to be at the core of the life of LHHBC 40 years later. Those are a few facts about Bill's involvement here over the past 60 years. But I wanted you to hear from, from some people who were impacted by Bill through his involvement in this congregation. So the first that I wanted to share with you today is, is Todd Mason. So Todd, if you could come up and share. Uh, yes, my name is Todd Mason, and I'm a member of this wonderful church. Bill Ballard was a friend of mine, like a lot of you have said tonight. And our friendship started because of the pew section we were in over there. <laughs> Joe and Bill Ballard were one of the first members of this church to introduce themselves to Betty and I. On Sundays, we normally would sit in the same location in the north rear pew, Joe, you remember that. Same section that the Ballards were in, and so we would always say hello to each other. Get up and shake each other's hand and see how we're doing. Betty and I began attending Bible study early in our membership of the church. We were lucky to have such great groups. Early on, we attended a Bible study at the Ballards' house at 15721 Candelaria Court in the city of Whittier. Bill and Joe led the Bible study that year, and it was quite a group, too. From that point on, Bill and I became friends. He would talk out, we would talk out under the patio after church each Sunday. Bill was always a pleasure to speak to. As we all know, he was pleasant, motivational. We would discuss faith, church, vacations, walking in Maui, families, business, and then around 1999, I got crazy and I, start, I decided to start my own business. And I had many new challenges. And there were not one, but several members of this church who really helped me out and got me off to a good start. Bill Ballard was one of them. At the time, Bill was president of W.T. Ballard. And as we've heard, he was also president of the uh, association Mahitas. Well, during this time, at the beginning of my new business, I found myself calling Bill periodically about all kinds of business issues and forklift questions. <laughs> Bill was very helpful in many different ways and in many different subjects, so he was, he was, I was very grateful about that. 
And as Jeff was saying, he's also the director of the Bible studies at the time. Bill and Joe called Betty and I out to go out to dinner one time. It wasn't the first time we were going out to dinner. But this time after dinner, they asked us to consider leading one of the Bible studies during the upcoming season. We accepted and we continued to lead Bible studies for many years after that. And I'm grateful for that. Bill and Joe are original, or also known as charter members, charter members of the church. They are, and the group is an amazing group. The members really did start this church. Today, our church family has a lot to be thankful for this group, and I'm very thankful that I know Bill, and he's my friend. As I was um, talking to people over the past few weeks about Bill, um, there are a lot of different remembrances that were brought up, and they ranged from, from helping people in business. Um, I was reminded today by Doug White that Bill actually played on the church basketball team. Um, surprisingly, he was the tallest one on the team. Um, probably thought they had brought a ringer in, but um, he played on that team. Um, he played tennis with people. There's a group that played tennis together. Um, Ray Runco talked of those times of playing tennis um, and of, of um, Bill being this person of great humor. In fact, uh, a person who played jokes on people and Ray was recalling when they were together somewhere and the group was getting into a taxi and they closed the door and they drove off without Ray. Um, so, so Bill is at the bottom of a lot of these kinds of things. They did stop and come back. Um, they didn't just leave him there. But um, So it ranged from all kinds of things. Another member, Steve Jensen, talked about how um, they wrestled with how they would send their daughter to Biola. <laughs> it cost some money. And, and Bill was the one that said to them, trust in God. God's going to make sure that happens. And, and it did. Numerous people, as I talked to them, said Joe and Bill were among the first people they met here in church, the first people who, who reached out and welcomed them and made a point of making them feel at home. Um, Mike Almonton talked about Bill as a man of conviction, who, who, which we've already heard about this, who lived out his faith in the marketplace, this incredible businessman who would not yield on his principles, even if others did. I want to close this segment with a short story from Del Kelly, who isn't here, he's in Missouri at this time, but it, it combines these various areas of Bill's life, his love of sports, his love of God, and, and most of all, his influence on others for good and, and for God. Del writes this, there are so many ways Bill influenced my walk with the Lord. Now I realize that he became very much a father figure as much as a great friend. One of my fondest memories of time spent with Bill was Wednesday nights at La Habra Tennis Center. My beloved wife had started home Bible studies and was bugging me to go with her on Wednesday night. As a young Christian, I felt that was just too intimate. So when I found out Bill played tennis, I set out to get a foursome together, and of course it just happened to fit perfectly on Wednesday night. How conveniently that ended all the bugging. Well, Bill, Doug White, Ray Runco, and yours truly hit the court and little did I know, I was really in a Bible study. As, as the when days passed, our group grew to over 16 guys. We were pretty competitive, and there was a lot of trash talk, but in the end, we formed lasting bonds. Thank you, Lord, for somehow placing me in with these guys. Bill has always supported and encouraged me in anything I have ever tried. He loved helping at the annual men's retreats. He was always one of the small group leaders and he even went up there when he was not up to it physically. Bill, I know that you are with the Lord, and I thank you for helping me know Jesus so that I will see you again. Perhaps we'll play tennis on courts of gold. Rest in peace, Del Kelly. Bill was foundational, not only in the shaping of this church, literally the shaping of this building, but more importantly, in shaping the lives of the individuals that make up this church family. We could go on and on. 
I could call on other people from our church, but you've heard a lot already tonight, and, and we want to hear a few more things, partly from you as well. We have heard some of these remembrances of Bill from his Biola family, his church family, his own family, and at this time, members of Bill's immediate family are going to come and share just a few words, and they'll be followed by some of Bill's grandchildren who will come and read those words of tribute for us tonight. Well, um, I'm not really well known for my public speaking skills, so I'm just going to share a few mem remembrances from uh, childhood growing up and just things I remember about our dad. Um, going way back when they first started at this church, I don't remember this because I was just a baby, but um, we attended church at the La, um, La Habra Walk-In Theater. That's where the original location was. And then we moved to this church. I remember the old layout. There was a little pond right down there that after church sometimes we go down to and throw rocks in the water and catch crawdads and stuff. Um, now it's been paved over and it's a shopping center. I'm not sure where the water went. Um, <clears throat> but um, true to his uh, Scottish heritage, he was proud of being frugal, but he always was a very good provider. Uh, we always lived in a nice house, had, you know, good, nice clothes, uh, good food on the table. Uh, my mom was able to stay at home uh, during our formative years and just help us as we were growing up. And um, we were afforded all the, the good lessons that we wanted that we never stuck with, <laughs> like piano. Um, and then we, we had a, our college education funded. We didn't have to take out student loans or anything. So he was very good that way, and they always were very... Um, focused and supportive in, in raising us uh, to be good Christians in the Lord and to have a good, strong faith. Um, just a couple of things that I remember that most people wouldn't ever have any reason to, to hear about uh, that I just thought I'd share with you um, were some of the fun things that we did together. He really liked to go camping, and we had a lot of great times uh, camping and going on road trips. And um, when he'd be driving, he'd make up little songs. Um, things with titles like Lucky Pupperoo or Whipping Along the Highway, and you just break out in song. And uh, I hear some chuckles back there. They remember those songs. Um, I also remember uh, time spent in Indian guides. And I, I don't know if any of you uh, have any experience with Indian guides, but one of the things they do is they come up with funny Indian names, I'll say, for uh, each of the people, the dads and the sons. And he was going a little prematurely gray at an early age. And so his Indian guy name was Gray Eagle. And uh, I couldn't sit still, so they called me Circling Hawk. And at the very end, they always had this um, closing ceremony where we'd all reach up like this and say, may the great, great spirits be with us until we meet again. And he was so tall that he could go like this and touch the ceiling. And all the kids really thought that was pretty swell. So. At the end, every time, we'd, we'd always make sure and have him do that, you know, at houses that didn't have real high ceilings. Um, <clears throat> another thing that I remember that I was really impressed with was when the company was small, um, there were some interesting people that used to work there. One was a lady named Ruth Burke, who I uh, came to find out was the mother of Tom and Dickie Smothers. And, uh, you know, I kind of like watching their show, and I was a fan back in the late 60s, which is the time that she was working there. And so we got a hold of um, the Mom Always Liked You Best album. And he took it in and said, hey, do you think the boys could maybe sign this? So he brought it back, and it was signed by um, Tom, Dick, the mom, and also the uh, producer of the album. And lo and behold, they had gotten the entire Smothers Brothers collection to include back with it when it came home. So we had uh, pretty much the entire collection to, to listen to um, as, as we were kids. And I, I was always impressed that they got to go on the show. I think uh, I remember the, the one night when that group, the association was on, they, they went to that one. And I think they also went over to Tom's house. And uh, another person that came to work a little bit later was a guy named uh, Winthrop Davenport, who people uh, called Wink for short. 
and he played in the uh, 1968 Mexico Olympics. He played volleyball, and later on his daughter got into tennis, and you might have heard of her as Lindsay Davenport. Um, so those are just a couple, couple little interesting facts about uh, him and the business. Wrote a couple other notes here, let me see. Uh, oh yeah, he, uh, as many of you know, he had a really great sense of humor, and he was always cracking jokes. And I think that's probably where I got my love of corny puns, because um, he was pretty good with his wordplay. And um, he always managed to stay upbeat. And even in the end, when he was suffering from shingles, and in the very last weeks when he was basically bedridden, um, he still kept a smiling face. And he was really cracking jokes right up till his last days. And that just shows the positive spirit that he always had. And uh, we know he was strong in his faith, and he's not suffering anymore. He's in a place that's very beautiful, and uh, we look forward to seeing him again someday. And now I believe uh, Julie is next. Well, hi, I'm Julie. I'm Bill's oldest daughter by two minutes, also known as one of the twins. I want to thank all of you for coming out. This is really special to us. And it's a blessing to hear all that's been shared tonight from the stage and one-on-one. -on -one. I know you all meant so much to my dad in many different ways. To me, he was my dad, and he called me Jules. He was a good dad. He liked to have fun, and as mentioned, he was very tall, <laughs> which came in handy for a little girl and a group of people because he was always ahead above the crowd. My mom said his height was in his legs. And I think that's why all of us kids walk fast now, because it was training under his long stride, just trying to keep up. Every summer, my parents would take Bill, Janet, and me on a long drive to stay at my grandparents in Mariposa to meet up with also our cousins from up there. And many have come down tonight. Thank you for coming. Or we'd go on camping trips, like was mentioned, uh, to Kings River and the driving was brought up before. So I was gonna say, I'm guessing some of you have ridden in the car with my dad as the driver. He liked to drive fast, finding the quickest, quickest way from point A to point B. And for us kids, bathroom breaks were an emergency basis only. Though I know many of you were sad to see my parents move down to San Diego area to live close to us. It was a blessing to care for him in his final years. He was surrounded by family, and this also allowed him to get to know his great-grandchildren better. After he passed, little Hazel, who was only one and a half years old, would go into his room and say, Papa Bill, heaven. My dad, in his later years, still liked to make record time while driving. <laughs> And even though he didn't stand as tall or walk as fast, his love for the Lord never faltered. We talked about, a lot about the hope of heaven, and not a wishful hope, but a promised hope. Titus 1-2 reads, In hope of eternal life, which God, that cannot lie, promised before the world began. The night my dad went to be with the Lord, my son Kellen and grandson Abel were over. We were looking at my dad's bookshelf, and on it was a trophy with a star on it. Abel asked my mom what it was, and she picked it up and read on the back of the trophy, and it said, well done, my good and faithful servant. In gratitude to Bill Ballard, this is a trophy he received right here at this church. And it was a moment where we all realized that my dad had heard those words firsthand from the Lord. I wish I could look all of you in the eye, like he would, and say, my dad, Bill Ballard, would like to see you in heaven. And if you can't say back, I'll see you there, Bill. Pastor Jeff will give you an opportunity tonight to do just that. In the words of my mom, to be continued. Hi, I'm Janet, and my tribute, I wanted to share a poem I wrote about my father with you today. 
When we were children, he carried us on his shoulders and flipped us on the bed. Happy memories of road trips, camping, and family bonding is something to be said. In our teen years, we would say, he would say, if you ever are in a situation with peer pressure to do something you know isn't right, we could always use him as an excuse to get out of the plight. We worked hard to provide, he worked hard to provide for the family, teaching by his words and his example. To work hard, be honest, humble, and true. His smile, charm, and silly way about him could keep you from feeling blue. I remember watching football together on Sundays and talking about sports and our favorite teams. He also took great joy in following his grandsons as they pursued their sports dreams. As we were cleaning out the Whittier home to downsize to their new home by the lake and deciding what to take, my boys were amazed by all the awards he had tucked away. And although he was honored, he humbly responded, saying he felt like he was bragging if he put them on display. Even with moving to a smaller home, he still managed to bring boxes full of things he cherished and protected. We now hold on to those treasure trinkets we have pulled from the boxes, as you may too have a trinket or two, knowing he gladly shared these things he collected. Blessing others by his works and finances was something he did on his own accord. He also loved to travel with my mom, sharing God's message as they journeyed the globe and explored. Now in heaven, his next adventure has started at home with our Lord. And one final note I'd like to say. Back in June, the family was able to gather and celebrate his 80th birthday and to honor him for Father's Day. He was happy and full of life. I'm grateful for the opportunity to keep that memory alive and know he was surrounded by his family to the very end. I will proudly carry on the legacy he has planted in my heart. In closing, I can still hear him telling me to make sure mom is happy. She meant so much to him. Kids going to come up and share some of those words for us now, I believe. <laughs> oh, the cards. Um, I thought they were going to be delivered to the Dodger grandson. <laughs> okay. Okay. They're, I guess they're coming here. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. They're just going to read them out loud just to give you a, a depth of, of some of the ways in which Bill is remembered by all of you. Thank you. Yeah. Gracious. Kind. Dependable. A leader. A mentor. Happy. Servant. There's definitely more than one word, but the finest man they've ever met. Mm. <laughs> Symbol. Welcoming. Christian. A true giver. Teacher. Sincere. Entertaining. Faithful. Honorable. Pleasant. Charismatic. Cheerful. Christian. Tall. <laughs> Friend. Gracious. Sincere. Easygoing. Steadfast and kind. Cool. Athletic. Witty. Godly. A true gentleman. Welcoming smile. Teaser. <laughs> Faithful. Encourager. Loving. Remarkable. Success. Kind. Energetic. Faithful. Servant. Korea. Honorable. Friendly. Solid. Motivational. Smile. Peaceful. Brilliant. 
Honorable. Kind. Example. Faithful. Happy. Humorous. Is that all the cards? Right? Mm -hmm. Got more. Spiritual. Welcoming. I think that's all of them. Thank you. What a great way to remember someone. Incredible, the depth and the breadth of those comments. Um, I invite you to listen to the word of God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God sent the son into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. As I pondered the message that I should share briefly at this service today, there was no other place to begin than with God's word, and no better place to begin than with these short, familiar verses from the Gospel of John. Bill was this student of the word, as I mentioned, he devoted hours of his life to helping people to study and grapple with this amazing revelation that God gives us in the scriptures. As you study the word, you realize that this God of the scriptures is in some ways a mystery, one that cannot easily be pinned down and put into the boxes made by humans. But the wisdom of our God is that the message God wants us to hear is at its heart very straightforward as Bill was very straightforward. In Jesus Christ, God tells us that he loves us, that he gives himself for us. And because of that, we have this incredulous gift of life, life raised out of death. God loves us not with flowery words, but with a love of flesh and blood, of self-sacrifice on our behalf. A God who loves us enough to go to the depths to rescue us from death. The incredibly good news is that God loves us. In spite of ourselves, God loves us. God loves Bill Ballard. And because Bill grasped that in the very depths of his heart, Bill lived his life. He lived it for that God of love. The God who revealed himself not only in the written word, but in Jesus Christ, the living word. The psalmist writes, blessed is the one who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. God loves his people so much that he, he wants them to live, to live to the fullest. God wants men and women to experience the wonders and the joys of being made in the very image of God, and so God gives us his law, his word, to guide us and to help us to flourish, and to be fruitful. This isn't a God who just wants us to follow the rules so we can feel good about ourselves. He wants us to become people of character, of integrity, of honesty, because that's who we were created to be. To do less is to settle for less than who we are. Bill was this person whose delight was in the law of the Lord, whose word he did meditate on regularly. Because of that, because that was so much a part of him, because he planted himself by these rich streams of water, Bill's life flourished and and the fruit it yielded is represented in so many of us who were impacted for God because of the man Bill was. Bill understood what it meant to be loved by God. And because of that, he lived for God. Paul writes, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. Even, even when we were dead in transgressions, it is by grace you have been saved. 
And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it's by grace you have been saved. Through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not by works so that no one can boast, for we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Sometimes it seems that being loved by God, being called by God, leads some to this sense of false pride. That's been an issue for people of God from from days gone by. Paul speaks to this very tendency when he talks about salvation not being about us or what we've done not about our decisions or our commitment or our good deeds, but it's by grace we've been saved. It's not from ourselves. It's a gift, a gift from God. Bill Ballard was this person who, who for me, as some people have already said, was, he was larger than life. He was successful, he was outgoing, generous. He was loved by people. When he spoke, people listened. He was tall and could have been quite... <clears throat> imposing simply because of his size, but, but Bill understood this heartbeat of the Christian faith, God's grace. And because he grasped the generosity of God's grace and, and the depths of God's forgiveness, Bill had this humility that was engaging. He understood his failures, and, and he understood the enduring love of God. He understood how privileged he was to be a child of God. But that never meant that he was inflated with self. I always marveled how at the men's retreat, which wonderfully always had a mix of ages from college to Bill's age, that Bill always wanted to go up there, even even when he could hardly get up there, but he went up there. I always noticed Bill, he was always interacting with the younger guys, didn't put himself above others, knew that he was human, just like all of us. I don't know a time where I spent any length of time with him that he wouldn't eventually tell me how fortunate he was, particularly how grateful he was that God placed Joe in his life. God knew how much he said he needed someone of strength and conviction, wisdom and grace. And Bill was humbled that he had been given a gift that God had given him in Joe. Paul writes, but whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more? I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings because like him in his death, and so somehow to attain the resurrection from the dead. In this letter to the Philippians, the Apostle Paul talks about this God who who enables his children to live freely, to see life from this larger perspective. Bill was this successful person, but that didn't mean he didn't have his share of disappointments in life. The amazing thing about the Lord that Bill followed is that, that this is a God who who laid aside what was his in order to serve others. God, because of who God is, has this larger perspective, a a greater understanding which enables God to to let go of smaller things in order to achieve greater things. One of the things I miss about Bill, which has been mentioned here numerous times, is his, his calm confidence in the midst of the pressing changes of our world. I could always go to him, and he'd help me see the larger picture. It was because he believed in this God who was always at work to achieve this greater perspective, to bring to completion God's most noble purposes. Paul writes, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will apport to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Paul talks about finishing the race, about keeping the faith. 
implies that he's been able to do that because he trusts in God's promises, and specifically in God's promise to come again. Bill was a Biola man, and I am a Presbyterian Reformed pastor, so you might say that we didn't always necessarily agree on end times theology. Um, um, but, but we both were um, fervent in our belief, our sure confidence that Jesus would return. Bill longed with Paul for the appearing of Christ, as, as do I. But for Bill, it wasn't a longing that meant he sat around waiting and theorizing about when and where. It was this faithful waiting, lived out in active running, in an active living and keeping of the faith. Bill was this beloved child of God who lived with this life of generous grace, who was, who was able to keep perspective in good and bad times and who kept it for his lifetime. But I must admit that although Bill would have loved being around all of us who have gathered here today, he would not have loved being the center necessarily of a service like this because he was this person who, who really did understand who he was and who God was. And he would be the first to say that it was because of who God is that enabled Bill to live the way he did. It was a hopeful person, not because he was just an optimistic person, but because the God he knew is this God of hope, of sure confidence. One of the phrases that's already been mentioned that Joe has said repeatedly over the past weeks as she has shared about Bill, about life, is this phrase, to be continued. To be continued. The living, the infinite, loving God is working out his purposes. We just glimpse a small piece of that immense eternity. And what God in his grace has revealed to us is this small segment of time. Our time on this earth ends, but God will continue to work out his purposes for all eternity, to be continued in the generations ahead and in the families that are still to come. And he offers that gift, that hope, that promise to all those who believe. God's not done when our lives on earth end or when this present earth is no more. Our lives in Christ are to be continued for all eternity in the presence of this holy Lord and among his grateful people. I close with this passage from Revelation, which once again points us not to what we have done, but to the great things God has done and to the great things God will do. As a result, we, along with Bill, as we receive him as our Savior, can be people of hope, free to live, free to love, free to serve with great humility and yet with the deepest of conviction. Revelation 7. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he sits on the throne. He who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. Never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat down on them nor any scorching heat. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will lead them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. This is the God of hope who continues his grace to eternity. I invite you just to pause for a moment to take time to give God thanks for the life of Bill Ballard, to in silent prayer offer up your gratitude to God for the way Bill touched your life. And after that time of silent prayer, of thanksgiving, I'll, I'll follow that with a spoken prayer. Let us give God thanks for, for the gift of Bill Ballard as we come to him in prayer.
O oh God, our Father, from whom we come and unto whom we return and in whom we live and move and have our being, we praise you for this gift of life, for its wonder and its mystery, for its friendships and its families. We thank you. We thank you for your guiding hand, which is with us in the high points and low points of life. And Lord, we thank you for William G. Ballard. We thank you for his broad smile, his wonderful sense of humor, his generous ways. We're grateful for his encouragement, for his faithfulness to family, to friends, to his church, and to your great causes that he served, such as Biola. We thank you for the joy that he shared with others about what you have done for him and for all who would receive you. We are so grateful for his example, for his integrity, for his conviction, for his courage. We remember all in him that made us love him. And we thank you for the way he impacted our lives and the lives of countless others who aren't even here today, who have passed on to be with you. Father, we thank you for revealing yourself and your love to us so clearly in our Lord Jesus Christ, and we're grateful for the hope you give us in the good news of that gospel. We thank you that our hope is based not on mere wishful thinking, but is founded in the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And we thank you that for Bill, death has passed. Peace has come. The promised life beyond this life has begun. Father, we know that we loved Bill. You know how much those gathered here will miss him. And so we ask that you would grant to these family and friends to Joe and Bill and Julie and Janet and the rest of the family, to each one of us. May you grant us the comfort of your presence and the ministry of your Holy Spirit. Renew us with gifts of patience, faith, enduring love. Help us to walk forth from here with eyes open to the beauty of this gift of life and with hearts filled with the love and joy found in walking with your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.
Wow. <laughs> we have a great God. Um, one of the things we can do as we, to honor people that we love and that we gather to remember is to emulate things in our lives that they stood for. Um, and as Julie mentioned, one of the things that obviously Bill would want from everyone would be to know that um, they follow Jesus Christ. So if that's something you haven't done and want to talk about what that would mean, please do talk to me afterwards. Um, we have a great God, we have a great hope, and we have a great future. I do invite you, the family invites you to join them for reception following in the social hall, which is right out the doors. Um, as the close of the service, if you'll let me escort the family out first so they can get through the doors first, then that would be a help to us. Um, but they do appreciate you staying and, and sharing memories and rejoicing in the life that we've shared together. Listen to these words from Revelation. But then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling of God is with men. He will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be with them. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. And then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty, I will give to drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. He who ever comes will inherit all this, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. May the love of God surround you and encourage you in any sorrow. May the power of the Spirit fill you and enable you to stand strong and may the peace of Jesus Christ be with you and fill you with a hope that never fails. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Alleluia. Amen.